Chapter 394 Eye of the Storm Lumion was also waiting with anticipation for the abandoned April Fool's team members to recall useful details. He nodded and replied, Got it. Madame Magician fixed her gaze on him for a few moments, lost in thought. In the future, if I assign you a mission that seems clearly problematic, you have the option to either reject it or discuss it face-to-face -face with me, while discreetly reaching out to other Major Arcana cardholders. Why? Lumion was a little confused. By doing so, isn't Madame Magician implying that something might happen to her? Magician chuckled self-deprecatingly. <laughs> because I'm a high-risk individual, susceptible to the influence of the Celestial Worthy. The Celestial Worthy holds the highest position in the Seer, Marauder, and Apprentice pathways. The higher the corresponding Beyonder sequence, the more susceptible one is to his influence. Everyone carries an oldest one within them, you see. And as a high-level beyonder of the Apprentice Pathway, and a believer in the Fool, it's natural for me to occasionally be led astray, fooled, or deceived by the Celestial Worthy. Of course, Mr. Fool himself also stands at the pinnacle of these three pathways, which is why he opposes the Celestial Worthy. So you need not worry about me. Most of the time, I'm under Mr. Fool's influence. There won't be anything wrong with my condition, but occasional anomalies might occur. It's akin to praying without a ritual or invoking a name beyond those three lines. All of that can draw the Celestial Worthy's attention and invite his response, potentially planting hidden dangers. High-ranking individuals in the Seer, Marauder, and Apprentice Pathways are closer to the Celestial Worthy and Mr. Fool. Even if one follows all the usual procedures, there's still a chance that something might go wrong. Lumion grasped Madame Magician's instructions before realizing that her words were revealing mysticism information that defied common sense. Mr. Fool and the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for Blessings could simultaneously hold the pinnacle of three pathways. Normally, reaching sequence zero in a pathway marked one as a true god. So what title did the individual at the peak of three pathways bear? A great existence? For the first time, Lumion began to comprehend that Mr. Fool and the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for Blessings might surpass even true gods like the Eternal Blazing Sun. Similarly, Amon's father, the ancient sun god, must belong to this echelon. After all, half of his inheritance had given rise to the one the Aurora Order believed in. Soon, Lumion remembered Madame Magician's distinct descriptions of different deities. Merely knowing of their existence and invoking their honorific names could corrupt certain deities, causing them to undergo mutations or face peril. Some deities could be mentioned in general terms, as long as one refrained from uttering their honorific names beyond the three lines of Beyonder language, thus avoiding attracting their attention. This likely represents the division among deities. Mr. Fool and the Celestial Worthy of Heaven and Earth for Blessings occupy three neighboring and interchangeable pathways. Is this a hidden requirement for mastering a composite pathway? Lumion dared not probe further, fearing that knowing too much might lead to unintended consequences. As for Madame Magician belonging to the Apprentice Pathway, he had anticipated it. Aurori's grimoires had mentioned that Sequence 9 apprentices in this pathway excelled at opening doors. Sequence Sevens were known as astrologers, aligning with Madame Magician's usual behavior and her occasional references to astrology, divination, and fate. Understood, Lumion replied. He went on to explain his plan. If he failed to eliminate Loki within two months, he intended to use the Iron and Blood Cross Order's internal processes to relocate from the Market District, as well as the problem about concealing the sealed mark on his body. Magician was very understanding. No problem. Although you can also write to me and use yourself as bait, Loki might have the patience to wait a few more months, and I can't always be with you. As for the issue of the seal, if you don't actively activate it, only beyonders of the seer, apprentice, and marauder pathways who believe in the celestial worthy can sense it directly. This is different from the uncontrollable aura of the celestial worthy. If you need something quickly, seek angelic protection from Mr. Fool or write to me. I'll craft a charm that can safeguard secrets. That's the best way to manage the Celestial Worthy's aura on the Two of Cups for now. Fortunately, evil gods like the Mother Tree of Desire no longer pay special attention to people like them. 
Lumian breathed a sigh of relief and inquired, Oh, can I share the information you just mentioned about the Celestial Worthy with the Two of Cups? Magician declined his request, explaining, Her Major Arcana cardholder will give her a simplified explanation, but it won't be as clear as what I just said. She doesn't know enough either. If you reveal everything I shared with you, it could put her in danger. Lumian didn't press further and watched as Madame Magician used starlight to create a dreamy door. She stepped through it and disappeared. The room's soundproof glass receded to its original state, and the crimson moonlight poured through the window, casting a glow on the table with the carbide lamp. Lumian settled by the bed, his mind racing, and he couldn't help but recall Loki's description of his exploits against Aurora. Taking a deep breath, he decided on his next course of action. Digesting the Pyromaniac Potion Kati du Jardin Botanique, Rupestre As dawn broke, Franca and Jenna made their way back to the market district along this street. For the time being, Franca hadn't figured out how to broach the subject of the dangerous situation from last night with Jenna. She used the excuse that Jenna's brother was at home and might overhear them, so she decided to delay the conversation until tonight. When they returned to Avenue du Marché, Jenna waved goodbye and headed towards Theatre de Lansan Keja Pigeons. However, before she could enter the modified brick-red three-story building, she noticed graffiti in a corner, almost resembling the work of a child. It served as a sign that the purifiers were calling for an urgent meeting, complete with time and location details. Jenna naturally averted her gaze and entered Theatre de Lansan Keja Pigeons. After about 15 minutes, in her role as the boss's lover, she left through the back door without any hindrance and arrived at a secluded alley near Eglise St. Robert. Before long, Valentine and Imre appeared. The former didn't waste time with pleasantries and got straight to the point, asking, Have you received any news about the terrifying aura from last night? Jenna was perplexed. What terrifying aura? You didn't sense it? Imre, who had some southern continent heritage, inquired with a furrowed brow. You didn't experience any nightmares? Jenna shook her head. I wasn't in the market district last night. I went home to visit my brother. Is that so? Imre examined Jenna's expression and concluded that she was telling the truth. She genuinely had no knowledge of the terrifying aura. The two purifiers briefly recounted the sudden appearance of a terrifying and violent aura on Rue de Blue Blanche the previous night, urging Jenna to be more vigilant towards anyone displaying unusual behavior lately. Jenna agreed and asked with curiosity, was that aura very noticeable? Why were you able to sense it even from the cathedral? It's hard to describe, Imre admitted. If you ever have the chance to experience it, you'll understand. He himself couldn't fully grasp the extent of the influence of the terrifying aura. After bidding farewell to the two purifiers and returning to Theatre de Lanza and Keja Pigeons, Jenna's thoughts turned to Franca, who had acted strangely last night. She had cryptically mentioned danger and advised Jenna to go home for a while. Eventually, she had come to share her bed late at night, explaining that something had occurred on Rue de Blue Blanche and that she couldn't return. That terrifying aura had appeared on Rue de Blue Blanche. Jenna nodded, piecing things together. Meanwhile, Franca finished her coffee and returned to her apartment on Rue de Blue Blanche, which had returned to its usual state. However, upon opening the door to apartment 601, she noticed that the invisible spider silk she had concealed in the crack had fallen. This could only mean one thing. Someone had entered. In the next instant, she spotted someone sitting in her recliner. It was Gardner Martin, a man with distinct facial features, brownish-red eyes, and a genial demeanor. A few gray strands of hair adorned his temples. Startled, Franca exclaimed, Why are you here? She was relieved that she hadn't returned with Lumion. Gardner Martin asked, bemused. What's your take on the aura from last night? What aura? Franco was perplexed. Gardner Martin, dressed in a formal suit without a bow tie, examined Franco closely and explained. A terrifying aura reeking of blood and rust. When did this happen? Franco recalled and shook her head. I was at Jenna's house last night. I wasn't in the market district. Gardner Martin nodded slowly and smiled. No wonder you didn't sense it. Apart from Ciel, Madame Hila, and me dealing with Loki, did anything else happen last night? Franco walked to the coffee table in confusion, 
picked up her cup and took a sip of water. What happened? Gardner Martin stood up and approached the window, looking down at Rue de Blue Blanche. Late last night, a violent and terrifying aura emerged from Building 6 on this street. It lasted nearly 10 seconds. Building 6. Building 6. Franca nearly choked on her own saliva. Isn't that the safe house I had rented through a lone merchant who had already left Treyar? Isn't that where I fought Loki last night? Could Madame Healer or Loki have caused the commotion? Or was it Ciel? Franca quickly regained her composure before Gardner Martin turned around. She felt as though she had missed many crucial details due to her fainting. Rue Anarchy, Alberge de Cocteret. Lumian, who had just returned from his morning exercises, had just changed into fresh clothes and was making his way to the first floor hall when he encountered Anthony Reed, who had been deeply engrossed in his investigation regarding General Phillips' widow and child. The psychiatrist glanced at Lumian and inquired, What happened in the market district last night? I've had numerous individuals attempting to buy information related to it from me. Lumian chuckled. <laughs> Perhaps a strange aura erupted from Rue de Blue Blanche. 